Hello, welcome to Chapter 15B. In Chapter 15B, we're going to continue looking at discounted cash flow methods for valuing entities, but in 15B, we're going to be using those methods to value entities for all the financial stakeholders, for debt holders, as well as for shareholders. I know that in the last chapter, I said we'd be mostly focused on valuing entities for shareholders only, and that's true, but we do need to understand the basics of valuing entities for everyone because there are times when you're going to want to get the value for all the stakeholders. So with that said, before this windstorm starts blowing my screen away, let's jump right into the material. So in Chapter 15b, we're going to be valuing entities very similarly to what we did in 15a, but now we're going to be looking for that enterprise value, and that's the value to all of the financial stakeholders, shareholders, equity holders, plus lenders. So let's start out by reminding ourselves what we mean by enterprise value of a firm. Enterprise value of a firm is just the, the value to everybody who's a financial stakeholder instead of equity value, which is the value to the shareholders only. And there are several measures of enterprise value, uh, just like there are several measures of equity that we've looked at. So first up, we've got the market's view of enterprise value, and that's always just like market value of equity, it's going to be the market value of the equity plus the market value of the firm's debt. And next, we want to think about potential investors and what enterprise value means to them. So there are a couple, couple ways for potential investors to suss this out. The first and the one that we're going to be most focused on um, is the DCF method. And in this case, the enterprise value is the present value of every stinking cash flow that uh, lenders and also shareholders believe will be coming from the company available for those two groups to split up in whatever way they've decided to split up. So that's what we're going to be focused on. And this is going to be what we're going to use for our best estimate of the intrinsic value or the true value of the enterprise value of the firm. And then as usual, we compare that to Mr. Market. And if our value is, if our estimate is much higher than Mr. Market, et cetera, et cetera. We go, we go from there. Um, another way uh, that potential investors estimate enterprise value is with what's called a multiple of EBITDA. This is a quick and dirty sort of way to do it um, that goes like this. You take an average of a whole bunch of comps and you find their multiple of enterprise value to EBITDA. In other words, for the first company, you find that its enterprise value based on market data, right, just based on market data is equal to five times 12 trailing months EBITDA. And the next one is 10. And if you were using just those two for your average, you'd say the most appropriate multiple of EBITDA for this type of comp is going to be 7.5, the average of those two. So it's just sort of uh, an average of all the comps. Quick and dirty, that's also used uh, fairly often. We're not going to deal with it. Okay, so using the DCF method, like we're going to be using, the Next obvious question is, if we're thinking about buying a company, how do we get the NPV of this project in enterprise value terms? Well, actually, it's very straightforward. So the NPV to everybody, right, all the financial stakeholders, which, as you know, we define as debt and equity holders, that's going to be the estimate, our DCF-based estimate of enterprise value, minus what we have to pay to get the entire firm, get the stock and get control of all its debt as well. So formulaically, what we're going to say is this will be minus the price paid for the firm for the debt and the equity plus the free cash flow, future free cash flows that we expect to get out of the firm for the rest of the firm's life while we are owning it that's available to both the lenders and the shareholders. So what are some caveats and 
further explanations about this? Well, like we said, the PP D plus E, that's the purchase price to get everything. We buy all this stock, but also control with the debt. Another way to think about this is, as I've described before, if we're buying a company, say there's a wonderful company out there, and we've just started a private equity firm and we want to buy it. So the firm's shares are available to be purchased for $80 million, and it's got a $20 million loan outstanding with J.P. Morgan Chase. So when we go to buy the firm, Jamie Dimon, is probably going to say, hey, you know, the old management was really awesome. I knew them. I trusted them. I made the loan to them. Based on that knowledge and that trust, you guys are just starting out. I don't know anything about you. So I'm going to make all the debt due and payable at the time when you buy all the shares. And again, that's written into virtually every loan contract and every bond set of contracts. It's called a change of control put, and the lender puts that in. So if the ownership changes in a major way of of a firm to potentially folks that the lender doesn't like that they can they can say okay that's fine we're out of here pay the loan back all right so that's the situation that we're going to be anticipating so what do we mean by this free cash flow to everybody in your eye that's going to be what we called in the last chapter our unlevered cash flow. That's the cash flow available from operations before any interest is paid to the lender. So it's not net income. It's going to be higher up the income statement. And of course, we're going to be morphing cash and accruals from the income statement into just cash, something like cash flow from operations. So that what we learned in the last chapter is that for the cases we'll be looking at, that turns out to be equal to EBIT times one minus the tax rate plus depreciation minus changes in working capital plus capital expenditures in that year I, the year that we're looking at. So let's discuss this a little bit further. EBIT times one minus the tax rate is called by everybody NOPAT, which stands for net operating profit after tax. And it represents cash and accruals uh, from operations available to owners and lenders. And then we use these other terms to go from cash and accruals to just cash. Um, for our simple accounting cases, is the only time we can say that this exact formula works. So it's going to be fine for us for the entire course, but it's good to remember this only works for cases where the financial accounting is fairly simple. Specifically, we're going to say it works when depreciation is our only non-cash expense and cash flow from investing is only going to be CapEx. There's nothing else in there. So a couple things that we want to remember in this case is to get the changing working capital in your eye, the EBIT in your eye, the depreciation in your eye. We're going to have to project forward our estimates for all of those quantities. And to do that, we use what is called pro forma projections. And we're going to learn more about pro forma projections later. And we'll use, we'll use some simple pro forma projections in this chapter, like we did in the last chapter. But we definitely need some way to project out what we think that the income statement is going to look like five years out, six years out, et cetera. And as we've learned all along with free cash flows, all of these quantities, EBIT, depreciation, et cetera, they're all calculated so that our free cash flow to everyone is going to be the maximum amount that can be made available to lenders and owners without impairing the future value of the firm. Okay, and while we're here on the subject of remembering things, I just want to make sure that you remember this formula because we're going to be using this formula throughout the rest of the chapter. This is the formula that gives us year by year future free cash flow available to lenders and owners. So let's call that equation 24. Okay, what other stuff that we need? in this formula is the weighted average cost of 
capital. So let's go and get that. So we've already reviewed the purchase price and we've reviewed the free cash flow. And let's remind ourselves about the weighted average cost of capital or the RWAC or the WAC, right? Variously called all three things. So our weighted average cost of capital is one minus the tax rate times our uh, interest rate on debt, uh, that's pre-tax, and uh, that's times our weight of debt plus our cost of equity capital, RE, times the weight of equity. And this is always going to be our appropriate opportunity cost of capital for computing our estimate of enterprise value. And just to remind ourselves of the terms in here, so RD is that pre-tax cost of debt financing. We know what the tax rate is, and 1 minus the tax rate represents the effect of the tax shield. RE is, again, our cost of equity. WD is our debt over debt plus market value of equity, which is what we called our enterprise value ratio when we were doing ratio analysis. And WE is weight of equity, so that'll be E over D plus E, and that's 1 minus WD, which makes it true. It's true. It's really true that WD weight of debt plus weight of equity always adds up to 1.